Well, good morning and welcome to the candidate forum for the Sacramento City Council District 6. The candidates um, in alphabetical order are David Drellinger, uh, I'm sorry, David Drellinger, uh, Eric Guerrera, Catherine Schuft, and Kevin Rooney. This forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters Sacramento County and the Sacramento Metro Cable Television Commission. I am Nolise Edwards, a member of the League of Women Voters of Sacramento County and the moderator for this forum. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization of women and men. We work at all levels to encourage and inform active participation in government. The League does not support or oppose political candidates or parties. However, we are a political organization and we do, after careful consideration and study, take positions on ballot measures and legislation. If you are interested in public policy or would like to support our volunteer work, we invite and encourage you to join us. The format for this forum will be as follows. Candidates will have one and a half minutes for an opening statement. You'll have one minute to answer questions in rotating order, and then you'll have one minute for closing statements. The timer is our lead volunteer, Lexi, who will give you the, 30, the, excuse me, the 30 seconds left and the stop sign. So watch her carefully. So now let's begin with opening statements. And I will begin with you, David, uh, for your opening statement. Thank you, Nolis. Uh, my name is David Drellinger. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, I stand before you today not as a polished politician, but as one of you, as a concerned citizen, who sees the promise of a better tomorrow slowly slipping away in our city. I'm here because I'm very grateful to my community and because I believe it deserves a representative who understands the struggles that are faced by the majority. I'm not a career politician, as I said, and I won't pretend to be. I'm here because I'm a fighter and I'm a problem solver. I've dedicated years to understanding the laws and government processes at Lincoln Law School, where I graduated with a Juris Doctorate degree. Today, more than ever, Sacramento needs someone who understands these processes and doesn't just talk about change, but has actually lived it and who knows how to make it happen. I've seen firsthand the gaps in our system as a former foster and group home youth, and I stand here today as proof that determination and, and with support, we can overcome any adversity that's faced, that we're faced with. Uh, I'm not afraid to challenge the status quo. Uh, I won't be swayed by political agendas, and my loyalty is only to the people of Sacramento and primarily those in District 6, where I call home. Uh, together, I believe we can recreate a community for everyone, where every, every single voice is heard, where every problem is met with a viable solution. I very well may be the underdog here today. I may be the wild card, but when you want the game to change, you play your wild card. I believe in the power and virtues of our democracy and the wills of its people to fight for a brighter future. That's why I'm asking for your vote in the upcoming election. Thank you. Great, thank you. Eric? Right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. And when you're watching it, I'm Eric Guerra, your council member for District 6. And I'm running for re-election to continue our community collective work to improving the opportunity for working families in our city. Growing up with housing insecurity, with uh, in poverty, and also with poor air quality here as a migrant farm worker in our region, with parents with only a fourth grade education, it's why after earning my engineering degree at Sac State here locally, I committed my time to advocating for our community. I've been proud of advocating and fighting for the construction of more affordable housing and to making sure that we were creating opportunities for working families. That's why I helped expand St. John's Center for Real Change with services and the workforce training to help people get a head start. I'm also now working with WellSpace to make sure that we're creating mental health and substance abuse services for those who are experiencing homelessness, homelessness so they can get a start in District 6. We're doing that in our own uh, council district. And in focusing on the issue of high wage jobs, like the community benefits agreement at Aggie Square that has helped out so many of our folks in our own zip codes. That's why I'm proud to be endorsed by the working people of our uh, city of Sacramento, our firefighters, our nurses. I've, that my environmental record is uh, why I've earned the endorsement of the Sierra Club, and I'm proud to have recently endorsed the endorsement of our Federation of Teachers who are educating and creating opportunities for people in Sacramento. I'd be honored to earn your vote here for District 6. Great, thank you, Eric. Catherine? Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting. My name is Casey Schuft. I grew up in Reading, and I was raised by a single mother who was very strong and raised a strong daughter. 
I then went to Chico State and put myself through college through grants and loans and finally moved here to Sacramento 23 years ago. 20 of those has been in my neighborhood of Colonial Heights. I served as a volunteer leader in my neighborhood association for 10 years, creating many community events that bring neighbors together and continue to organize, organize those events. My neighborhood was left out in the cold in the last redistricting without a council member, and that has been almost two years that we've had to fight for ourselves. This past summer, I realized how frustrated my neighbors were while walking my dogs through, through my neighborhood with no response from city, no response from any department to help us with the crime element in our, in our small neighborhood. I formed a coalition that now has over 60 members, and through the experience of the coalition, I've learned so much about the finger pointing, inaction, and failings of our local government. So I decided to be a part of the solution and run for City Council District 6, so vote for me. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'll call you KC from here on out. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Kevin. Hello, my name is Kevin Rooney, running for City Council District 6. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I came I come from a fifth generation Sacramento on both sides of my family before 1850, which was then known as New Helvetia. Mm -hmm. I went to Rio Americano High School, graduated from Humboldt State University, and I'm still running a 33-year-old service and repair plumbing business. I'm running for council, city council district six for two main reasons, the homelessness and the police and safety. With the homelessness, to, uh, I would like to have it uh, to talk to other council members if I do get elected and have them uh, have no public camping on any uh, public areas. And with the police department and the safety, I would have the police department, I would just, I would hire more police officers, but I will get into that later on. So those two reasons are the main reasons why I'm running for city council. And I know I am the lone coyote. I am 180 degrees different than on these thoughts and procedures that I'm running for, for the city council district six. So that's why I am asking for your vote on March 5th. Great. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank all of you for your um, opening statement. So let's move now to the um, questions that we have received from the community. And first and foremost, we're going to start with homelessness and affordable housing. That We, we received a lot, a lot of uh, inquiry about that and concern about that. We, had, um, we received a number of questions on homelessness and housing that reflect mounting concern and frustration for residents and businesses in Sacramento. So the first question I have, and I will start with you you, um, Eric. The first question I have is the number of unhoused individuals continues to skyrocket. We know this requires multifaceted and budget-driven solutions at all levels of government. What are your short and long-term solutions? Yes. Thank you very much. The, uh, on the long-term solutions, it's in making sure that we're preventing homelessness, which is why I've focused specifically on increasing highway jobs and locally. When someone has a good job with health care, they can catch their mental health or substance abuse issues and create some financial stability. That's part of the community benefits agreement with Aggie Square. On the short-term solutions, it's the immediate uh, 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 siting of more uh, uh, housing locations like the one at Wellspace that I talked about, 175 units. We've grown over the last four years over a thousand and that's why we have to continue to work with our city and county. But this is a regional challenge. One city alone is not going to solve the issue. Make this city county partnership and now bringing in other cities through the local homelessness action plan for the county is how we're going to be able to address this. We're stronger together. Great. Thank you. Catherine? Um, homelessness. Oh. Thank you. Casey. Um, <laughs> in preparation for this forum I watched uh, a few previous forums from uh, previous uh, district races. One was between Jay Chenier and Tamika Lecluse, and they brought up homelessness back in 2018. Mayor Starnberg brought it up in 2019. He even went to Texas to visit Haven for Hope. And then again in 2022, in the race with Tamiko and Katie, Katie mentioned a plan 
to uh, solve this crisis, and ultimately nothing has been done. I believe that we cannot keep sweeping people across the city. The housing that's been approved won't be ready for months, years. We need a short-term solution right now, and that is safe ground sites. Every district needs to participate. If each district opened just two safe ground sites, we could at least begin to get on top of this. Great, thank you. David? Thank you, Nolis. My short-term plan to prevent the rising numbers in the unsheltered would be immediately, uh, if I I'm elected to, to office, would be to implement stronger tenant protections for those who are currently facing eviction. Uh, the long-term plan would be for the city of Sacramento to enter into the housing market as a market participant to purchase 500 Connex containers and to uh, retrofit them into bunkhouses, into kitchens, into laundromats, into showers, and into small villages that we could place up along, uh, up and down along the Stockton Boulevard, Watt Avenue, and Power Inn corridors, where we could immediately create villages that would shelter the unhoused, that would get them in out of the rain, and we'll begin the process of reintegrating them into the society that has left them behind at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin? With the short term, I would have it, I'd given them a certain amount of time for the homeless to decide if they want to stay in Sacramento City, and I know this is a wild thought, but this is how I deeply feel, because things have not been getting any better for the last 20 years. They get worse and worse and worse. They say that people say they care. Well, I care too, but it's, 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 we have to do something about it. So, short term, no more public camping at all. If they don't like it, they can, they can leave Sacramento uh, City, go somewhere else, or we can help them. We, the, there's places out near Ranch Merida, the boys' home. We can house them out there, and we can help them out. The long term is, in four years, they're going to come back, and they're going to say one thing or two things. Thank you for saving my life or not going to jail. Great. Thank you. So let's go to question two. And, David, I'm going to start with you. How would you ensure housing stability for individuals living in more affordable housing who may not be able to afford monthly payments? So thank you for the question, mm -hmm. Elise. Um, as, as I uh, just said, one of the most important things here is more rigorous tenant protections. Um, we, we have to prevent, we have to turn off the spout. Right now, uh, due to, a, I believe, a lack of action, on the part of the current uh, city council, we, we are seeing more and more homeless every single day, more and more unsheltered people. Um, and I believe that's, that's paramount. Um, and that's where I would start. Uh, additionally, we, I, I think it's okay for the, our government to supplement, to seek federal funds, um, to, be, to subsidize uh, those who are, face, who are faced with the evictions. And that would be my, uh, my, my main response to that question, Nolise. Great. Kevin? I am a firm believer in the free enterprise system. There are so many jobs out there. I currently have 15 employees. I talk to other plumbing owners and other trades owners. They're not desperate, but they need workers. They need people to work. No one wants to work. If a lot of these people were to get jobs at, let's say, $20 an hour, you can do the math. That's five days a week. That's $3,000. And if they're married, as a couple, that's around $6,000. The, it's the workforce. They have to get out there and work and not depend so much on the government. Don't depend on the family. Don't depend on friends. Depend on yourself. Depend on your own two hands. So there's so many jobs out there, and so many employers need workers. It's, I say we start with getting a job and be self-reliant. Catherine? All right, Casey, excuse me. I'm going to get this right. Casey? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> the cost of living has skyrocketed over the last several years, making many uh, living situations unbearable and unaffordable. For example, um, we definitely need uh, tighter tenant rights, tighter tenant protections. People need a place to live. That goes without saying. The one that's about to expire at the end of the year needs to continue, but also include more tenant rights and protections. I'm a 
absolute proponent for affordable housing and inclusionary housing. We have a, a Mercy Housing project that is just going up just south of my neighborhood in Colonial Heights. And it looks like there are a couple of other housing situations that um, have just started the application process. We need more affordable housing to accommodate the people who are struggling in our society, who work three jobs and live in their car. We need to protect our citizens and our current city council does not appear to be doing that. We need to help everyone unhoused and housed alike. Great, thank you. Eric? Thank you. I'm glad that it was what was mentioned about Mercy Housing, a project that I work specifically identifying vacant lots. And I worked also right down the road, which we will be seeing another 100 units with mutual housing at the old San Juan Motel site. Those are clear examples where I've worked for the last uh, two terms to find vacant lots and get people to invest in Stockton Boulevard. Now we see almost 700 units that are planned for that area because of the work that we have did with permit streamlining, making the, the bureaucracy easier. The fee waiver program for affordable housing construction development in areas where there's transit oriented development. All of these are located also where we're now going to be building a bus rapid transit. If we can reduce not only the cost of housing by getting gap financing, which I advocated for from both state, federal, and local dollars, then we, and doing that where we have transportation, we improve our air and reduce the cost of transportation for folks. Finally, I also created the rental assistance program when we had the federal dollars, and I was also the author of the tenant protection program that was mentioned that's going to expire, and I've already requested that we extend it permanently. Great. Great. Thank you. All right, the next question, and I'll begin with you, Casey. Um, simply building more won't necessarily address affordability concerns. What steps should the city council, I'm sorry, what steps should the city take in the future to ensure affordability needs will be met? That's a great question. Number one, um, I think the minimum wage does not address our current cost of living. I think that needs to be uh, increased. I think that there need to be more grant programs uh, for uh, home buying. I think that there is a lot that our current city has not done to support our current population, which has of course led to our current unhoused homeless crisis. I think there are many options uh, with regard to grant money that could be uh, uh, advocated and ultimately provide that security to our population. Great. Thank you. Eric? Thank you very much. As I started in my introduction, fighting for higher wages, for jobs, not everyone will or wants to go get a four-year degree. But if, they, if we support apprenticeship programs to be able to help people into these high-wage jobs and making sure that they have an opportunity, my mother at the age of 50 was able to come to Sacramento here with me and go to college and get her GED and her AA degree and started her career in early childhood education. I worked with the Sacramento Women and Girls Coalition to create a child care program also with an apprenticeship program. So we're training people into child care uh, that also fills the gap because fo working families can't get an education and training if we don't have child care so they can go to, to, to school and work. And also going back, the tenant protection program to making sure that we don't have scrupulous landlords that go after tenants, making sure that we continue that program, make that pro program, extend that program uh, from the sunset. It's been successful, and that's why the state continued. And then I supported the state legislation that tightened the statewide loopholes. Thanks. Kevin, and then I'll end with you, David. Thank you. I've had a lot of people come in, and they wanted to start up, or they wanted to start out making a lot of money instead of you, a lot of people have to start out at the bottom and then go up. I don't know if it's a new age system, but a lot of these teenagers and 20 year olds, they just want to start up making a lot of money in the beginning and and they have to earn their way up as they learn trades. Now rent control, I'm against rent control. There are owners of apartment complexes where rent control came in and they thought, we're not charging enough, we're going to charge more. And the tenants, they didn't like it. So I am against rent control. And um, with, this, with the health care, I believe that you can get different statistics. I believe it's 93 percent of the mental or the homelessness is due to alcohol and drug related. I know there's there's mental illness out there, but 
Great. Stop. Thank you. David? Thank you, Nalise. Um, <clears throat> the cost of building right now is a huge issue. Uh, as I previously stated, I would immediately seek to have the city of Sacramento enter into the housing market as a market participant. Um, there is still the issue of uh, red tape that requires the city to pay prevailing wage, which is 40 to 50 percent above well, what the competitive market wage is. But there are a lot of ideas out there where we can instantly put infrastructure in that's much cheaper than what the, the, the city council is saying uh, would be the average cost of a one unit apartment right now. Right now, the estimate is 560000 to $1 million to build a one unit apartment. And that is not economical. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense in many ways. Um, my Connex container idea, if we were to instantly purchase uh, as a market participant and retrofit these, we would find our way into very many single family and bunkhouse units that uh, would stand as affordable uh, living options for not just the people who are living in Sacramento, but the, the future economy. Great. Thank you. All right, our next question, and Kevin, I'm going to begin with you, and then David, catch your breath, because you're going to go after Kevin. Thank you. Um, what role would affordable housing play in advancing racial equity in Sacramento under your leadership? That's a very interesting question. I believe straight across the board, I don't care if someone's black, white, brown, blue, purple, it should be straight across the board. Um, the same with the employment situation. Um, I don't. I don't believe in the um, the the racial um, equity. I mean, it, it's important for everyone to to work to get to that point to solve their own issues and to, to take care of themselves. Um, again, I am the lone wolf in this idea. Um, there are certain, a certain small percentage of people that do, would need help. And whether it's, whether it's a male or female or whatever race it is, if they do need help, then the government, I do believe in helping them out, especially the, the mentally ill. Okay, great. David, and then Eric, I'll go to you after that. Thank you, Nolis. Mm -hmm. um, the promise of home ownership is very important for people to buy into this civic life. Um, and many of the projects that we have right now in Sacramento that are, uh, that are predominantly uh, people of color in Sacramento, the bricks, uh, projects that are in, in Oak Park and, uh, and the likes, uh, we see little to no tenant protections. We see no home, home ownership. They're all rentals. And uh, if we're bringing in affordable housing options, we're introducing future options for future generations to buy into the idea of Sacramento, because I believe Sacramento is a great city. I believe we have a great potential to lead the way uh, into the future in not, not just affordable housing, but in racial equity. And, uh, and we should be doing that. We should be taking for, uh, greater steps to ensure uh, racial equality and affordable housing uh, as a city and as a state. So oh, that's, that's my answer, Nolise. Thank you. Eric? And then Thank you. The you fact is it. that Sacramento has a terrible multi-decade history of redlining, and District 6 is an example. And we had many working families and many veterans, people who worked for armed services, who weren't allowed to buy in certain parts of our city. And because of that, that created these income disparities that have created multi-generational uh, areas of poverty. This is why I've been an advocate for mixed income housing, the missile middle housing, so that we have the ability to have different housing types that people can enter into the market now in our neighborhoods, in our communities. And also to make sure that that's in the forefront when we're talking about affordable housing is let's not replete the, the mistakes of the past. Also, working with affordable housing providers that have the wraparound services, it's not enough just to build cheap housing. We have to have housing providers that have on-site services so they get the workforce training, the child care, the support services, so they have the expendable income to help them become the, in that next level of a career to be able to provide themselves so they can become financially dependent and own a home. Thank you. Casey? 
Uh, yes, I agree. Re, uh, redlining has definitely a very long history here in Sacramento. As a realtor, I've seen it myself, and I it, it still shocks me to this day that it is still an issue. I think that everyone deserves the ability to own a home. There are dream programs that are available, but there is still a, a racial equality situation and a racial bias, and it. It blows my mind. It's it's not something that we sh anyone should have to worry about in the in their ability to to purchase a home. And as far as affordable housing, that's absolutely needed. Inclusionary housing is absolutely needed, and builders need to focus on that. And we as city council need to enforce that ability for everyone to be included in that dream. Thank you very much. All right, we'll go on to the next question. And Eric, I'll, I'll start with you. Two city council members have asked the city to explore a citywide daytime ban on homeless encampments. Do you support this idea? Why or why not? Yes, yes uh, I'm one of those folks who asked us to explore that, to look what other cities have done and to see if there's an opportunity in the short-term solution. The long-term solution is critically building housing, wages, support services, those are issues. But today, one of the issues that people that are experiencing homeless face is the, is the inability to store their stuff. The, the idea of a, being able to have a, a place for people to go and to have their, their belongings not stolen is critical. And also to have locations like our uh, core centers. When people can go to a place where they have services and get them connected. That is the intent of us trying to explore what other cities are doing to encourage people who are on the street to go to locations where we can tap them into the triage centers and the triage services. I think we have to look at every option. And if it doesn't work, then that's my training as an engineer. You explore, you test, does it make sense? And if not, then you say no and move on to the next item that might work. Great, thank you. Casey? Our current city council has had years to address this crisis, which is now an absolute crisis. Years of no action, just words, just lots of talking about it. I think this daytime ban is an absolute band-aid. Our current city council, that's all they seem to be willing to do are band-aids. I mentioned earlier, we need safe ground campsites to Put, some, put our homeless people locally to get them services, to triage, determine if it's drug addiction, if it's a mental health um, situation, if they just need a job. We need to be able to bring services to our homeless people, not give them a place to put their stuff. We, they need a safe place to be and live and shower, charge their cell phone, be a human being. Right, Kevin? I believe that there should be no public camping on public grounds in the city of Sacramento. There are places, let's say an example, there's a, the boys' home out at Rancho Marietta. It houses 110 beds with, on 40 acres. Well, a lot of these homeless people, we could help them out. They can even bring their own tents if they like and they would get help. Again, it's around, it's a, around 90 to 93% is drug related and alcohol. Now there are, there's 2% of hard, uh, having a hard time financially, but we could help those people out. And I am against the, the, the statewide ban on, on camping. So that's my, um, my feelings. It's a, it'd be a double positive, helping out the homeless, getting them on, back on their feet, and, and not driving underneath T Street, under the freeways, as the situation gets worse. Great, thank you. David? Thank you, Nolis. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has already determined, in the case Martin v. Boise, that a ban on camping on public property until the city has adequate shelter beds is unconstitutional. That's the job of the, of the, the Ninth Circuit uh, uh, Court of Appeals. We currently have a case running through the Supreme Court right now called Grants Pass. Hopefully they reaffirm the decision in Martin v. Boise. And right now, any push to illegalize any ordinance that would make illegal the camping on public property is per se unconstitutional. It takes somebody who understands the laws 
who understands the way that the government works to even know that investing time, investing man hours, and in, in voting yes on such an ordinance is the government acting in such a way that would violate the Constitution of the United States because they give the, the Court of Appeals that deference, that decision to interpret the laws. And uh, so this law would be unconstitutional. A ban on daytime camping would be unconstitutional. This is not about storage because currently the police are using the excuse of you're storing your, public, your property on public, uh, public lands. So I, I believe that this would be a bad decision and we can't move forward with it. Great. Thank you. And the last question um, in this category, and I'll begin with you, Casey. The Sacramento County DA recently filed a lawsuit against the city alleging it fails to enforce its ordinances in regarding homeless um, population, um, our homeless population, excuse me. Do you support the lawsuit? And if elected, how would you address the lawsuit's allegations? That's a great question. Um, I've met with Tin twice, and the first time was in August, shortly after he threatened the city with a lawsuit. And at the time, my city, my my uh, neighborhood, uh, was overrun with crime and a couple of homeless camps as well. And when I say homeless camps, the situation that they were living in was unconscionable. The health situation, the the filth that they're forced to live in was terrible. Um, and when I met with Tin, I absolutely support his lawsuit. However, I do think it's a little short-sighted. I think the county should also be involved in this as they are in the same position as the city as far as their inaction. I recently learned there are tw there's $25 million that the county has been given and it has not been touched and that's been almost a year that they've had that money. The county put uh, sweeps our homeless into the city to put the onus on them and ultimately I think they are both to blame. Thank you. David? Thank you, police. Um, I believe uh, District Attorney Ho, his heart was in the right place when he started this, this push. Um, the city council has a very a very big burden on their shoulders. Um, and his idea to, to charge them with various crimes for not addressing the issue, I believe it's, it's not misplaced. Uh, I would be willing to subject myself to such a lawsuit if I was sitting on the city council and I neglected my duty to the point that uh, my wage was raised up beyond $100,000, but there were still people suffering on the streets. I believe it's a, it's a great idea in, a, in its concept. However, I believe it's been twisted and blown out of proportion, and now District Attorney Ho supports a, a daytime camping ban. Um, I believe when you politicize issues like this, rather than get to the nitty gritty and make common sense decisions, that they can, this is what can happen. Um, so I, I do believe it would be wise to hold government responsible for their shortcomings. Um, and and to, to stick to that, to not allow it to become politicized. Thank you. Great, Kevin, and then Eric. Yeah, I, I agree with um, Hope on the, on the lawsuit. Um, as I look at the whole situation, you know, I hear so many people, they talk about the homelessness, how bad it is, and they talk about it, and they talk about it, and they say how much they care. Of course, I care also, but my idea is there has to be something done as the old saying is, just get her done. And I look at a forecast, where does Sacramento City want to be in, let's say, a year from now, three years from now, five years from now? I ask my son that. Where do you want to be in a year from now? And as I look at Sacramento City, I can tell you where Sacramento City is going to be in one year from now, three years from now, five years from now. You think Sacramento City is bad now? Wait for three years from now, five years from now, and it'll be totally different than it is now because we talk and talk and talk and talk, we don't get anything done, and it's going to be a lot worse, unfortunately. Thank you. Eric? Thank you. I, I also uh, believe that the district attorney's uh, heart is in finding a solution is in the right place. But the lawsuit itself is a distraction from the real work. The real work that needs to happen is what we've been doing now with the new city and county partnership. And that's an, have had the ability for us to actually work cooperatively and to have more spaces and more locations to be able to cite places for housing with mental health and substance abuse services. To take advantage, full advantage of the 
the federal funding of the full service partnership that comes with funding for housing with those. Until we have to have more of that collective work, we're not going to make a difference. But now that we have the city and county partnership, we actually are. We're building a mental health and uh, substance abuse crisis center that both the sheriffs, the police department, and our health advocates can use. It's going to be co-located with therapists on site. The real work is working with Hope Cooperative, with First Steps Community, with St. John Center for Real Change, where we created pathways for people out of this uh, situation and into stability. Great. All right. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the next uh, focus of our questions, which is policing. And Casey, I'm going to begin with you, and then David, you, would, you will follow her. The first question is, many say reducing gun violence calls for more than registering firearms and trying to get guns off the streets. What strategies and or policies have you supported to address gun violence prevention? And if elected, what strategies or policies will you move forward to reduce gun violence in our communities? Ooh, that is a really <laughs> big question. <laughs> um, I honestly am not sure how to answer that. Um, I personally am not a gun supporter. Uh, I do not own a gun. I have never felt the need to own a gun. Um, I have shot guns before, uh, but I am aware that uh, there is a considerable amount of gun violence, um, especially in our schools uh, nationwide. Um, children should not have to fear going to school. Um, I'll be quite honest, and this is not a, an answer that anyone wants to hear from uh, someone running for office, but uh, I don't have an answer for that right now. Um, I, gun violence is not anything that we should have to deal with, but we also live in America where the Second Amendment is a thing. Um, I don't think anyone needs to own automatic, uh, semi-automatic rifles. I think, ooh, I'm just going to ramble on here. <laughs> that is such a big topic to discuss. So um, I don't have an answer for that right now. Thank you. It is a, it is a huge, uh, a huge area issue area. Uh, David. Thank you, Nolis. Um, as a father of, of a 10-year-old boy who's uh, currently attending school right now, I believe gun violence prevention is is huge. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Judge Benitez in San Diego repealed. Cal Cal common sense California laws that require background checks to pr for the purchase of ammunition. Uh, while I am a proponent of the Constitution and Second Amendment rights uh, appropriately used, you do not, as Casey said, you do not need an assault rifle to protect your house. Um, we do need digital cameras in every outlet that would, uh, that would sell guns. Uh, and we do need common sense uh, regulation with regards to ammo, because you can have a gun, but if you can't access the ammo, you can't do any damage. You can't do any gun violence. Most importantly, we need mental health. We need we need to destigmatize mental health in District Six. So, uh, as a policy, I would declare District Six a mental health safe haven, and we would have uh, festivals to raise awareness around mental health as it pertains to domestic violence, as it pertains to gun violence, and the many other issues that we're uh, faced with as a result of mental mental health stigma stigmatization. The stigma surrounding mental health. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Kevin? I am for the Second Amendment, and I am totally for guns, for people to protect themselves the way things are going in this society. Currently, Sacramento has around 800 policemen, and we need more policemen. There should be around 1,350 police in Sacramento City. Currently, or that would be 1.4 per thousand residents in Sacramento City. And, you know, Sacramento, it's, it's getting worse in crime. And I know the guns have a lot to do with it. And it's, it's ranked sixth in the nation, meaning you know, there's five other cities with more crime than Sacramento. But getting back to the gun situation, there's a little city in Virginia City, Nevada. You walk around there, everyone has a gun. They have little guns here, guns here. There's no violence at all. And I'm not saying if everyone packed there would be no violence. I'm not saying that, but I am pro Second Amendment and I'm for guns. Thank you. Eric? Thank you. Uh, one, our youth have uh, had a serious trauma during COVID 
and mental health and supporting our youth is one of the most critical things. Prior to COVID, we had two years where we had no youth homicides. And that's because we focused on intervention, we focused on gun violence interruption, and we focused on making sure that we had community leaders connecting with those in that community that are potentially connected to gun violence. The fact is that I would be working and continue to work with organizations like Moms Demand Action, with the Sierra Health Foundation, that have worked with experts on this. I'd support the continued effort of the gun buyback program, where even for just simply $20, people uh, for gas cars would come up and say, you know what, I don't really need this gun anymore. That's reminding people that if they don't need their gun, they should relinquish it. And if they do have a firearm, that they should store it properly. That's why I would work with those experts that are looking at same safe gun storage laws. Finally, even with all of the youth intervention, uh, we need to continue to focus it on youth. Great, thank you. Let's move on to the second question. And David, I will begin with you, and then Kevin, you will follow. Uh, policing policies and practices have been, have been at the forefront of public discussion and review in recent years. How do you define public safety and what may need to change, if anything, to build trust that law enforcement will serve all communities uh, in a fair and balanced and equitable way? I would define public safety as uh, a community that feels safe in their own neighborhood, to walk their children to school, um, to go to work, uh, where they know that they're not going to be a, a victim of violence or just stupidity, people running uh, red lights and, and uh, dr driving under the influence. I believe that in order to reestablish the trust, the lost trust that uh, our community has in its law enforcement, we need to implement higher levels of education, higher requirements for the police. I don't believe in defunding the police entirely. I believe in educating them and creating a higher bar because when they're out on the streets and we, we task them with uh, our protection, uh, we need to make sure they have a proper understanding of the laws. We need to make sure that they are uh, trained in implicit bias. We need to make sure that they are culturally appropriate to the neighborhoods that they serve. And that will build a stronger sense of safety in our neighborhoods and public safety. Great, thank you. Kevin? Joe Rooney, he was my great uncle. He was the chief of police of Sacramento in 1968, 1969. The city of Sacramento back then was much different than it is now. Again, we have approximately 800 officers in the city of Sacramento, and sometimes they're getting called out from one part of the city all the way to the other part of the city. We need more officers. I would say 1,250, maybe 13 or 1,400 officers would really help out. And again, it's 1.4 officers per thousand and per, per thousand citizens in Sacramento City. And um, I'm just, I am pro-police, and I, I think there should be an increase in the budget of the police department. So. That, that's how I look at the, for the future of Sacramento City. Thank you. Eric? Thank you. Law, public safety doesn't just include law enforcement. It includes also our firefighters and our medical personnel and our educators. And that's why I voted on a resolution to include youth and in, in early outreach as part of our public safety mission. And for, this is why I'm working with our police department, our firefighter, uh, firefighters and educators, to create a pipeline of our youth into these public sector jobs that pay good wages in health care in areas with low income. We can address the wage gap by having the Law Academy at Hiram Johnson connected with the Law, the, the, the law Academy at Sac State and Sac City College, where not only uh, students here in our own neighborhoods in South Sacramento can go to uh, and have a direct pipeline. The CSO program will pay them higher wages than most of their parents and be ready for the academy. And when we have people that are recruited from our own neighborhoods, they connect with our neighborhoods and have higher trust. That's the long-term strategy, not recruiting firefighters, law enforcement, and other folks from other cities. Recruit our own. Thank you. Casey? Uh, public safety is definitely a topic of concern in Sacramento and has definitely been a, a concern in my own neighborhood. Um, the p topic of police is definitely complicated. As a white person, I have never felt a fear of the police. I've never felt a fear for my, li my life as a result of being uh, 
in front of a police officer. I can, however, recognize that it, that is my privilege. And I recently learned that approximately 80% of people of color that were stopped by police, there was no citation given. So what are they doing with their time? I think there definitely needs to be a higher level of education uh, required to become a police officer, better training, better racial bias training, and ultimately, spend more money on our youth. We need to invest more in our youth. We spend so much time on suppression. We need to in spend money on youth programs, involve our youth, give them the opportunity to be involved. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next question. And Eric, I will begin with you and then uh, Casey. Um, do you see the need for civilian oversight and or review of law enforcement practices and policies? Why or why not? Yeah. Uh, I think for any uh, agency, which is why we also have a civilian president over our military. It's part of our government. The, um, this is why when I came onto the council, I made the first effort to reform what we had, which was a, a review body that just did a report on our, uh, on our police department uh, and made it into an actual commission of appointed people from every district so that there was more involvement. And now I'm working with Council Member Jennings uh, and two other council members uh, as well to be able to improve on that and to have a stronger advisory body. I think the more we have engagement with oversight and advisory, we can, we can address the blind spots that we naturally have. All of us have in, uh, biases within ourselves. The council does. Even our own departments do. So it's important to have another body that's an advisory body that looks at us to, so that we can address those potential blind spots so we move together, uh, forward together as a city. Casey? Uh, yes, I think civilian oversight over all of our government agencies is important. Uh, it keeps them accountable. I think over the last several years, uh, there's definitely been a lack of transparency and a lack of accountability. And I think civilian oversight is very important to keep everyone honest and that we know what's going on and that someone else can give their opinion and their statistics to that body and ultimately keep us all uh, involved and ultimately keep everyone in a position where we feel that we are being informed of everything that's going on and then that feedback can be used of course to make a position better. Great. Kevin? Yes, I believe that the, there should be a civilian oversight in all categories of the city functions. And then there should be perhaps a review board on, yeah, perhaps every district. Because a lot of times there could be an overlap and there could be certain aspects of, let's say, the police department where there could be uh, something missing there or the fire department or other agencies. So I think in all agencies of the, for the city of Sacramento, there should be an oversight, uh, not empowering, but just to... Make sure everything's running correctly. Thank you. David? I actually agree with Kevin on this point. <clears throat> um, we do need civilian oversight in every area of the government. We need transparency and accountability, and that's why there's a lot of distrust of government today. Uh, internal affairs, the idea that a police agency could effectively investigate themselves is an inherent conflict of interest. Uh, we have very many issues that we can point to in, in recent Sacramento history, such as Stefan Clark, right? Uh, two officers shot uh, a black man in his backyard for holding a cell phone 23 times, and there was no accountability. The, the uh, department investigated themselves, and, and uh, Jared Robinette and Terrence Mercadal are, are still, um, uh, at least one of the officers is, is still a member of the Sacramento Police Department, and that's a very big issue. Um, we have a conflict of interest time and time again when we do not have civilian oversight in government because this is our money, this is our budget, and we absolutely need civilian oversight in law enforcement and other government. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Well, let's move on to uh, the next um, issue area, uh, and that's dealing with climate. 
Um, I, I had one more question in the police area, but I think given our timing, I, I might have to um, move forward with that um, discussion. We'll continue to have that in future days. Um, but under climate, I'm going to begin, uh, David, with you. Sorry. Thank you, Nolis. For the first question is, what should voters expect from you on environmental and climate change action? Um, immediately, if I'm elected to the, the seat in District 6, I would uh, begin to remedy one issue that, that I see um, that may, maybe the, the current council can be to blame or the incumbent could be to blame. We do not have a environmental protection agency air monitor in District 6. For some reason, the incumbent chose to forego this and to go with a much lower level, uh, which does not ensure uh, high enough quality of air standard in our district. Uh, this is a huge oversight. Uh, I've begun to, the, the process already of speaking with Breathe Sacramento um, and seeing how we could roll this back and we can get an environmental protection agency air monitor in our district. Because when you look at uh, society, uh, you can take a measure of society, it's been said, by how they treat their most affected demographic. And District 6 is the most affected demographic from my perspective in Sacramento. And the fact that we would not care about the air that these children are breathing, that our neighbors are breathing, um, that's an issue. I would also uh, begin the process of making sure that for every tree that's uprooted, that we plant two back. Thank you. Great, thank you. Kevin? When it comes to the climate and the environment, I, again, I'm at 180 degrees different on a lot of people on this topic. Last summer, they had the hottest summer of all time that they measured. Well, they measured these hot spots in parking lots on concrete. And the temperature has gone up, I believe it's one hundredth of one percent in the world. And here we're spending billions and billions, not billions, perhaps trillions, all this money on trying to have the climate control and a in a better environment. But more important is that when they talk about the climate control, I, I don't buy it. I think, it, I'm not saying it's a hoax. There are, you know, the ocean is rising in certain areas. And, but to, to ruin an economy when we're pouring so much money into the United Nations to, for the climate control, I'm totally against it. Okay, great, Eric? Great, thank you. This isn't some that I'm extremely proud of the work that we've done here and that I've done as chair of the Air District, as a, as a California Air Resources Board member, to number one, take a strong lead in electrifying and creating in our county, not only the first, but the second, first and second largest electric school bus fleet in the nation. We designated Sacramento uh, from state designation with funding for a California air protection zone. And with our own city funding, we added to uh, the federal air monitors that the federal government chooses to have to have the largest integrated air monitoring program for our entire city on top of that to create a fellowship program. I call it the Clean Air Fellowship Program with our air district so that we're training the next environmental um, leaders and stewards of our community at Sac State and UC Davis. Also, I'm very proud of my actions on land use and making sure that we're focusing on infill so that they're building housing around transit corridors and creating the first bus transit system in our county. All of these are coupled together so that we can reduce our VMT and clean our air and have a more responsible community. Great. Thank you. Casey? Um, thank you. I would uh, personally address the climate issue by asking the Air Resources Board, of which the incumbent is a part of, why there isn't a federally regulated air monitor located specifically in South Sacramento, regardless of what was said. Our poorest population and most industry lives in that area. The tree canopy is also the thinnest in that area, and it also has the poorest air quality. The reason why a federally regulated air monitor is important is because it is the only one that can be used in a court of law as evidence, and that is very important uh, to show what is going on? And we don't know specifically what is going on with the air quality, which can lead to all sorts of health uh, situations, issues, and perhaps death. It's important that we know and have a factual data that will show us exactly what is going on in South Sacramento. And in addition, the obvious is we need more trees in South Sacramento. Great. Okay. 
So let's move on to the next question. And I will begin with you, Eric, and then David, you will follow. Air quality improvement and greenhouse gas reductions are urgent regional goals. How will you manage competing interest of low density housing development and increased highway uh, slash roadway travel against mass transit utilization and active transportation, the advocates between the two. How would you manage that? Yeah. Well, this is clearly why um, I've dedicated and focused a lot of time since I've ran for office to lead not only for our city, but with the region to create what's the Green Means Grow program, to advocate for those infill kind of uh, 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 pro uh, properties. That's why Stockton Boulevard uh, is the example that other cities and regions are now taking on. It's led to also the state saying, yes, infill on these commercial corridors can revitalize, provide more opportunity for, for the local businesses, and it creates a stronger public transit system. Uh, on the issue of air quality, one city and one district can't do it alone. This is why I'm working with the nine northern counties and the farmers in the region, so that they have options other than burning, because when they burn, that comes down our valley and affects us. All of this of air quality doesn't, uh, it, uh, it doesn't, um, is not restricted to political boundaries. We have to work with our areas. That's why I'm also working with El Dorado and Placer on the force mitigation in my role on the uh, Basin Control Council. And I've taken that leadership on to say all of these things have to be connected, workforce, timing, transportation. It's about responsible land use policy that I've shown. And one of the exciting projects for housing is mutual housing on Stockton Boulevard. That's going to do that. Yeah. David? Um, as Eric just said, if in order to remedy the issues that we have, it's going to require a multifaceted approach. Uh, some of the ideas that I brought forth uh, here today, um, I think, are a good starting point. Um, it takes interagency cooperation. It takes transparency and oversight. And um, if we choose to play a different game, if you choose to play a wild card, such as myself, uh, you're going to see a different approach. And um, I believe the environment's very important. I believe safety and education is very important. I believe uh, dealing with the issues that District 6 is facing, uh, I would be able to maintain them as my priority because this will be the only thing that I'll be doing. I won't have a, another job. I won't be running other political races. Um, and if you give, it, give me the opportunity, I believe I can do better for District 6. Thank you. Great, thank you. Casey? Would you repeat the question, please? Sure. Air quality improvement and greenhouse gas reductions are urgent regional goals. How will you manage competing interest of low density housing development and increased highway um, slash roadway travel against mass transit utilization and active transportation? How would you manage the, the advocacy between the two? Um, yes, so uh, infill is definitely important. Sacramento, or st specifically Stockton Boulevard, has so many vacant lots, so many vacant buildings, and so many absent property owners that do not take care of those buildings. I believe that something needs to be done to hold these property owners accountable. There are so many buildings that could be used for unhoused f to, to really utilize our Stockton Boulevard corridor. I would also uh, include more routes for rapid transit. It's so important. We are a driving city, and I believe that more people drive than use rapid transit. There need to be more routes that uh, go to our poorer neighborhoods so that they can also utilize those. So thank you. Thank you. Kevin? I think everyone's for nice air and air quality. And, but when it comes to, let's say, the greenhouse effect, and, and then they, talk, they mention the air quality control, I'm about the budget also. As long as we don't spend too much money and ruin an economy to have, you know, to keep down the greenhouse effect. I mean, I like it, and everyone else likes it, where we can see the mountains near Lake Tahoe from Sacramento. Now, I know in August it's, it's different, but everyone, well, I'm, I'm for clean air, and I'm for a clean environment also. But to ruin an economy, to bring down a little tiny aspect of greenhouse gases, I, I'm, I'm against. And the, the batteries, there's a lot of people now not buying those car batteries, and now that we're going to convert over to the batteries for the buses, a lot of people are are buying gas vehicles and turning in their battery vehicles.
Great, thank you. We have so many more questions in these areas, but given the essence of time, and uh, we're going to um, end the round of questions and uh, let you all do your closing, uh, your minute closing statements. And we'll begin with you, Eric, followed by Kevin, and then Casey, and then David. Okay. Well, I want to thank the League of Women Voters first for this opportunity and for making sure that we have access to uh, education when people go to vote. This is a critical decision, and I'm proud to have served the District uh, 6, not only as a president for the Tahoe Park Neighborhood Association, I got involved through our tree planting efforts that led me to see the needs that we need to do, to encourage our local wage jobs here, high wage jobs, to prevent homelessness, to build more housing on Stockton Boulevard, as we're seeing now happening from the work that I've done with our community. And to focus on our youth uh, by funding the after school programs that I was able to start at our elementary schools on robotics so that we're training young people for the technology of the future. That's why I'm proud to be endorsed by our teachers. I'm proud to be endorsed by the Sierra Club for my environmental work because air quality is about our kids who get affected by their lung development. I'm proud to be endorsed by our firefighters, our public safety officers, all of those folks and our nurses right now who are helping us because if we don't manage good public health, if we don't have strong families, then we don't have strong communities. And I'd be honored to earn your vote. Great. Thank you. Kevin? Yes. Again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters. And I want to be proud of Sacramento City. I don't want to be embarrassed. I want to tell people when they ask me, where are you from? I want to be proud to say I'm from Sacramento. But, and not to be negative, but as I see the homeless, you know, I see the garbage, the needles, the feces, the batteries. Now I see open fires. And I ask myself when I'm driving by these camps, where are the environmentalists on these issues, especially the Sacramento River? And I also want to see where will we be in a year from now, three years from now, five years from now with Sacramento City. It is time to make extreme, not extreme, but major drastic changes in our decision making for the city of Sacramento. So on March 5th, if you like my ideas, you can vote for me for City Council District 6. Great. Thank you. Casey? Thank you. I'm a grassroots campaign, and as a regular citizen of Sacramento, a city, I a city I love, I will not work for corporations, charter schools, or PACs. The people need a voice, not someone who works for large donations. I'm not a career politician, and I don't have higher political aspirations. I never in my life thought I would be running for local government, but the absolute failings of our current local government have spurred me to be a part of the solution. I think most Sacramentans are done with career politicians who have lost sight of their constituents. Sacramento is an amazing city, and we are tired of the inaction and ineptitude of our city officials. We're in a place right now where we need new leadership. We can't rely on the current people who have been in leadership positions that have given us the current crisis. It's time for change. Less talk. More action is needed. I believe I can be that person for District 6. I'm not a politician again, and I am ready to work for all of us. I'll bring back accountability and transparency. So vote for me on March 5th. Great. Thank you. And David. Thank you, Nolise. And uh, thank you, League of Women Voters, for the opportunity. I believe it was Einstein that said that repeating the same process and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. Uh, that's why I'm here. I want to try something different. I know that the city of Sacramento wants to try something different, <clears throat> especially in speaking with my constituents in District 6. Uh, Sac Sacramento is the capital of California, okay? California is the tip of the spear when it comes to fighting for issues uh, that create opportunity, that create racial equality. And um, the future looks bleak right now. We have a current a federal government and a Supreme Court that's rolling back uh, many of the issues that California fought for, that California led the way. Uh, it, and I believe we can change things up. I believe we ha we're at a critical stage right now where we can begin to roll things forward again with regards to uh, women's rights, with regards to the Constitution. And um, it's going to start in District 6. District 6 is a big, important area in Sacramento, and many people feel disenfranchised, like their votes don't count. But your vote does count. So please vote for me on March 5th. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you very much. This concludes our forum. I want to thank all the candidates for participating in the forum and answering the important questions from the voters. Um, you can find your ballot and nonpartisan voter information on candidates and propositions at vote. 411.org, and we hope that this forum provided additional insight into the field of candidates that you see here and that you would pass on what you have learned, and we ask that you pass on the recording of this forum. Thank you very much.